Welcome back to the Impact Driven Leader Podcast. This is your host, Tyler Dickerhoff. Man, I am glad you are turning in, tuning in, watching on YouTube, listening wherever you're listening. Excited to share today's conversation with a fellow Cornell University alumni. Actually, he and I were there at the same time as I learned reading his book, Unreasonable Hospitality. Today's guest is Will Godara. Will is the author of Unreasonable Hospitality, a phenomenal book that's going to be part of our Impact Driven Leader book club here for the month of May. As well, he was principal. He was partner to the number one ranked restaurant in the world, 11 Madison Park. You're going to hear so much wisdom from Will. It, truly one of the most enjoyable books that I've read in quite some time. I'm excited for this conversation. Not only do we have a good time just chatting and, and actually reliving a little bit of our college days, but so much beyond that, Will shares so much wisdom. I'm excited for you to take part in this episode. Be, where, be ready. Take some notes. Uh, I will wrap up at the end and I will share kind of the few things that I took away that really impressed upon me from Will's experience, but also things that maybe caught him that he didn't realize impacted him as much, um, which I'm grateful that we had that conversation. Here's one other piece that I want to share with you. May 8th and 9th, just a few days away. If you're listening to this as it's released, I'm hosting the Impact Driven Workshop. It's a workshop for HR directors, VPs, team leaders that are trying to navigate the season we're in right now. What is going on? How do we make sure that we build an environment where team members thrive? Oftentimes, we are the peanut butter and jelly in the sandwich between senior leadership and those team members. How do we manage through that? That's what I want to share in the workshop. Excited to extend that offer. We'd love to have you there. Go to impactdrivenworkshop.com to get more details, register. I'd love for you to be there and enjoy in the conversation. All right, one last thing. If you could be so kind to be a show reviewer, rater, leave a review. Let me know what you think about this conversation. Let me know what you think about the impact driven leader. One, so I can get better. So two, we can develop the community to impact those around us even more. And that's what happens when you leave a review or a rating. It allows those that listen to this show to get more value. I want that for you. I want that for others. Again, thanks for tuning in wherever you are. If you're not subscribed on YouTube and you watch it there, make sure you go to YouTube, Impact Driven Leader, YouTube channel, watch it. All right, here's my conversation with Will. Will, thank you so much for joining me. Man, I'm excited for this conversation. I'm excited for really two reasons. Um, I don't run, I don't interact with a lot of Cornell graduates uh, on a daily basis. And so I'm excited to interact about that a little bit, bring back some memories at Cornell. As I shared with you before we were getting ready, reading your book re brought me back to a lot of those memories. And uh, that made not only a connection made it fun, but with that also enthralled. I am absolutely enthralled how you took hospitality beyond a point of hospitality, but into a leadership style that allowed for hospitality to be replicated. Hmm. Um, so cool. I'd love I love like the way you of... articulated that. Okay. Well, um, and, I, and I, Hey, on behalf ahead, of Cornell, yeah. maybe we can do a little PR work because in, in the entertainment world, like the two people that people think about from Cornell is Andy from the office. Uh -huh. And then whatever that guy was in white Lotus. Oh, and yes. I just feel like Cornell's not been well represented in, in Hollywood okay. these days. And so maybe you and I today can begin to reframe that. Here's what, here's just a, a total <laughs> snippet. If, if people want to fast forward a couple seconds, that's okay. I came to Cornell as a non New Yorker, meaning mm -hmm. I was from out of state. And what I found is people that came to Cornell from out of state or didn't have a family member that were there had a much different opinion of Cornell than people that were from New York and then endeared to Cornell. There was, there's pretty drastic, like, yeah, I went to Cornell. Okay, fine. But it wasn't like this badge of honor that I'm like, look how proud, because it really didn't mean much to my family or me. I did after the accomplishment, but it wasn't like this legacy piece. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, it was different for me, man, in the sense that 
I wanted to go to Cornell since I was 12 years old because, I mean, it was the perfect confluence of, of going to the best hospitality school in the country that yeah. also was an Ivy League school. And so, yeah. like, in this whole idea that I've always talked to people about, about setting just the biggest, best goals you can set for yourself, given who I was and what yeah. I wanted to do with my life, it was all Cornell. And we... We've already talked before we started recording about the weather and how it was not um, the most uh, welcoming, to uh -huh. put it in hospitality terms. But outside of that, I, I yeah. just loved it up there. Yeah, no, I mean, I think back fondly, the experience, the uh, I'm appreciative of it. I think what's interesting is, you know, so I went to Cornell for animal science degree, number one animal science school right? Number one hotel school. People didn't really like hospitality. I mean, they're great at a lot of things that no one cares about. They're great at <laughs> hockey. They're great at lacrosse. They're great at things no one cares about until they care about it, right? Yeah. If, you, if you don't have food to eat or if you don't have a nice restaurant hotel to stay at, you care about it, but you don't care about it until you need to care about it. You know, it's funny. A lot of the time I talk to people coming up in their career and trying to figure out where they should go work next. And one of the things I always tell people is, hey, you should not be limiting your search to just the companies with the biggest names. You need to be looking for the place that has the most to teach you about the thing, the specific thing you want to learn about. And where your boss is actually the person that you're very excited to work for. Man, that's, um, but in, that, the, in the first in the first category, it, it applies kind of well to this conversation. Uh, we could stop right there. We're we're about four minutes in, and you've left a, a an absolute platter full of gold. Um, <laughs> now I'm going to try to tie in here in the conversation, but what be we'll come back to that. I promise we'll come back to that. But I want to hear from you for someone. I'm not a foodie. I, I'm going to admit it. I'm not a foodie, um, but I'm enthralled again by the industry as you describe it, because I do love hospitality and I love that great experience. And you talk so much about experience. So help the listener that maybe hasn't read your book yet. I, I surely hope after this, they get it because it's entirely well worth it. And then more buy 10 copies to give to people. Um, but beyond that, explain how you came about this great, wonderful desire to kind of turn the hospitality industry on its head? Hmm. Well, a few things that I want to say. First, you talked about how I approached my work by showing that hospitality as a leadership skill could actually translate it into a service skill. And you know, when you take a step back, that's that's pretty intuitive, right? I, one of my my mentors, Danny Meyer, one of the things that he said back in the day that sticks with me today is that hospitality is a team sport, um, and I and I think that applies to to really any service industry business, right? The person at the top of the hierarchy has really no capacity to impact very many of the people they're serving. The only scalable approach you can take to ensuring that every one of your customers or your guests is served in the way that you want them to serve is to first serve the people that will end up serving those customers and guests. Because until you create an environment where the people who you work with are inclined to do what you would do in the room, even when you're not there, until they understand fundamentally how good it receive, how good it feels to receive hospitality such that they're inclined and inspired to want to pay it forward until you can give the people on your team, not only the permission, but the resources to bring their own creativity to a hospitable expression. It's not a scalable approach to take the work. And so, I mean, I just genuinely believe that it's the most appropriate and honestly, the only genuinely impactful approach to take if you are in the business of trying to make people happy. If you can't serve the people on your front line, they have an inability to serve your customers. Um, it's, it, 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 yeah, no, I, I think about this as if, if, you know, it's the law of the lid, that's a John Maxwell concept. And, you know, if you're a 10, you, you can only people below you can only be as high as a nine or whatever. And, and, and that's not limiting them. They need to go be their own 10. But 
if you're a seven, then the capacity of those below you can only reach that lid. And, and I think about this if from a hospitality perspective, if I'm not hospitable, if I'm not serving, if I'm not caring about the people working for me, then there's no way possible they can care for the guest long-term. You can do it short-term maybe, but then they're going to find out I don't fit here. Mm. And, and vice versa is if they're not of the capacity where they want to serve people at the level of expectation, right? That you're serving them. They're either going to rise to the occasion or like, I don't fit here. Yeah. And, I also think it has to do with just the, the extent to which the people who work for you feel trusted by you and the ability to trust you in return. Um, because with trust comes support. And in, until you feel like the people you work for genuinely have your back, how could you ever expect them to give their full selves to the work? When, when I go to, when I'm on an airplane or I go to get a coffee at a poorly run Starbucks or when I'm checking into a hotel that's bad. It, okay, A, let's just be clear. I'm calling the hotel bad. I'm calling the Starbucks poorly run. And I'm doing those things, not having anything to do with the product. Yeah. But because of the way that one individual made me feel. Sure. There's a lot of people out there that in those moments say that that person is the problem. When in reality, it has nothing to do with the person. It has to do with their leader because what it means yeah. if someone in that room so clearly doesn't care about you as a customer, it means that their leader has made one of two mistakes. They either have not shown the person how good it feels to show hospitality to others, or perhaps they just haven't trained them on what that looks like, or it means that the leader has hired someone that doesn't care. And in spite of the efforts to show them why they should care, they've allowed them to stay on the team. But every single person has an outsized and asymmetrical impact on the operation as a whole, because I go to a Starbucks, I have one bad interaction with one person. And now I'm saying to you, it's poorly run, right? One person can make or break it. And so if you're talking about the lid of a leader, I think the other approach is the basement of your poorest performer. Yeah. Um, that one individual can define the reputation of your entire business. Well, and it, it, I guess the, the question I want to ask there is which one of those, you, know, you talk about the, uh, the feeling of people, the, the process, if that's what we expect, or the eradication of the poor performers, which do you feel is like, in your experience through running your restaurants, going through, you know, EMP to be able to take it from one point where you started to, you know, the pinnacle, what was the, the, the defining of those three, if we keep it within that triad? Well, I think they're, they're all required because you can't actually identify who a performer, a poor performer is until you've given all of yourself to try to make them great. Ooh. And so Ooh. you need to start well, wait, with that. Wait, can, I, can, I, can I ask you to share that again, Will? That was good. <laughs> Let me see if I can say it the exact same way. You can't. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I identify <laughs> a poor performer until you've given all of yourself to make them great. Yeah, good. They're perfect. Because um, here's the thing. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book is this idea of hiring slow and firing fast. Yeah. But I had a caveat, like hire slow, fire fast, but not too fast. Um, I think a lot of people give up on certain members of their team because those people aren't performing exactly as expected. But the leader never took the time to do two things. One, inspire those people to want to be better versions of themselves or B, get to know those people well enough to make sure that they were set up for success, whether that means receiving more training or putting them in the right position where they're actually you know, set up to, to utilize all of the skills that are innate to them. And so I think, you know, it's innocent until proven guilty. Everyone on your team has the capacity to be great and you need to give all of yourself to make them great. And then if they just don't care, then it's time to let them go. Well, I think you could, they have a place to be great. And maybe the place isn't where you're at. 
Yeah. And, maybe and the place that, is in a different position within your organization. Absolutely. And if that yeah. doesn't work, maybe it's just not in your organization at all. Maybe they need to go flourish somewhere else. Totally. I think that's where I, I think a lot of leaders struggle is this idea of, oh, if they're not right here, then it's something on me instead of, oh, if I fire them, right? If I say this isn't working, then it's this internal animosity instead of saying this isn't working. I am going to, you know, find a place for you to work. I, I learned that from Alan Mulally. Alan did that when he took over at mm -hmm. Ford's like, hey, I love you. I'm just you don't fit here. And I would imagine you saw that circumstances, especially at the the cultural turnover. You know, we're seeing that, I think, in a lot of organizations today where we have, you know, industries that can work uh, remote and, and they're having people that are like, I want to work remote. And they're like, no, no, we're an office. We're an eight to five job, even though it doesn't require that. That's the mentality in thinking, well, the person that wants to work remote just doesn't fit in your job anymore. Let By the way, go. neither, Let go neither find person's someone. wrong in that exchange. Yeah, There's exactly. And, it's, and and that that is the changeover I think we're seeing in cultures and in the leaders that are secure in themselves are doing well there. The ones that are insecure and they say, well, this is the only way I know how to accomplish it, right? It's if you go back and to, to try to tie in, you know, to have this, um, you know, elite experience, this elaborate fine dining experience. And, and, you know, you were to go into it and say, well, this is the only way it's ever been done. As I read from your book, that is not the way you approached it. You're like, no, we're going to turn it around and say, how can we focus differently? Yeah, and eventually I'm going to answer the question you asked first. I want to do one more <laughs> aside, aside. We're going to have a lot of asides in this conversation, I think. Um, at new hire orientation, which I did often, I, I thought it was a really, really important part about joining our company was that yeah. you spent an hour with me. And I spent the first 20 minutes listening to everyone introduce themselves because I always loved the idea of people who joined the team within a two month period, becoming a class of sorts and, and feeling bonded to one another. And the only way a group of people can feel any sort of meaningful connection is if they have a moment to learn a few things about one another and yeah. they're not just professionally linked, but also personally linked in some small yeah. way. But at the end of that new hire orientation, the last thing I would say um, was, hey, you're here, you've just started, the energy in this room is awesome, you're all fired up. If there comes a day when you don't love your job anymore, this is my request. Come and talk to us, our doors are always open. Perhaps there's something we can change or fix to make sure you love it. But if you come and talk to us and we can't, then please leave. In other words, it was me saying, you have to love your job in order to work here, which sounds tyrannical. But really what I believe is that everyone deserves to work alongside other people that love their jobs. Yeah. And everyone also deserves to love their job. And so if you're in a job that you can't stand, not only are you selling yourself short by being in a place that doesn't bring you joy, but by the mere decision to continue working there, whether you intend to or not, that energy negatively infects those around you. Everyone. And Even if you're not in a person-to-person -person business, it eventually affects everyone. Yes. And so there's this one woman on my team, Laura Wagstaff, who's one of my closest friends and who is like my cultural kind of teammate as we identify the culture of our company. We normally saw eye to eye on many things, but that was one of the things she always hated when I did that at New Hire Meeting. Because she's like, hey, the energy is really good. It's a little bit of a buzzkill right at the end. But I believe being a great leader is setting very clear expectations with your team around what you expect the very first day. Oh, yeah. And even if that means it's not all, you know, teddy bears and, and flowers on day one, I think having the really fun conversations and also the very direct challenging conversations right from the get-go set up the most clear and strong foundation from which people can build something amazing together. Wow. I mean, the, I would say the, the additional layer to that is stating it in that first meeting, right? As a leader, making that um, decree, but then going beyond that to say, I have to hold up to that. 
Yeah. Because if I don't hold up to that, even though I say it in the new hire meeting, eventually that's going to permeate the organization where they're like, oh, Will just says that he doesn't mean it. It's like, yes. well, then that becomes a cultural problem instead of saying, no, he says it. And when they go interact with someone, they're like, I don't love it here. Go talk to Will. Right. Instead of like, well, he's just saying that he doesn't really want to listen. to you. He's just saying that to appease you or or, you know, spin something that that statement and then action sticking with it is more important than really kind of the um, the entire process. Like, how do I stick to that? I think that three of the most important ingredients in a leader engendering trust from their people are A, taking the time to show the people that you work with that you want to get to know them, that you care enough about them as individuals beyond just bodies to fill a role, that you will invest time to get to know them, time that does not have a clearly defined return. That's one. Two, being very clear and setting expectations with the team on what your non-negotiables are and how you will make decisions. And then three, being as close to unwaveringly consistent as humanly possible in holding people accountable to those very non-negotiables that you just set their expectations around. I wrote that down as connection, communication, consistency. Hmm. I love that. And that's, you know, you, you think about that as a, as a leader, I believe this. I believe this is it's something that I speak a lot with. I, I try to, you know, communicate through um, my community is that it all starts with connection. If you're, you know, you talk, as I interpret what you're talking about at the new hire, you're looking to build a connection with those people that day. You're setting expectations. You're setting the environment. That is, you're asking for their identity. So they're a part of it. That's connecting. I mean, we did that here as, as we got started. We connect over, you know, Cornell. We connected about other things. We connected about, you know, my background, agriculture, agriculture the hat you're wearing. That to me moves relationships along. For sure. That's me that's intentional, but it's also, I know how we're going to get the most out of this is if we build that. And then it's having those expectations, like you're saying, and then staying with it. Having that, that ability to communicate as a leader is imperative. And then... The consistency is, is I allude back to is, hey, I need to hold true to that even when I don't want to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You can't always hold people accountable or you can't only hold people accountable when you have enough energy to. Sometimes you need to yeah. dig deep into the tank and find the energy even when you don't think you have it. I think connection, by the way, is also the cornerstone of hospitality, okay. right? Like when you... One of the most beautiful and clear and efficient ways to engender connection with other people is to show them that they are seen, to give them a sense of belonging, to remind them that you will take the time to hear what they say and then do something with what you heard. That is hospitality. Like when you go into a great hospitality place, whether it's a restaurant or hotel or any number of other service businesses that have making the choice to be in the hospitality industry. That's the one thing they haunt and they all have in common is that the person you're being served by has taken the time to get to know you and they're delivering an experience to you that is unique to you. Um all right, I'm gonna answer your question now. How <laughs> did this become the the guiding principle or focus in my approach to restaurants? Well, for me it started with an accolade that I was aspiring to achieve, okay. um, which I think is fine. I, accolades are important and dangerous. Um, they're dangerous because if you start working for the accolade alone, then you can quickly look up and realize you've lost your way. Mm -hmm. But you can use them as a tool to help motivate you and help push you further than you would normally be inclined to go. Um, the accolade in question came, I had been at this restaurant, 11 Madison Park for four years. When I got there, it was kind of a middling brasserie in the first few years we were there through a focus on excellence, almost a maniacal focus on the product and the excellence of that product. We improved dramatically to the point where we went from no Michelin stars to three Michelin stars, two New York Times stars to four. And for those of you unfamiliar with 
the words I just used, <laughs> those are the highest ratings yeah. you can get in the restaurant business. But there was this one other that eluded me, which was to be on the list of the 50 best restaurants in the world. And um, we finally got invited to that that ceremony. And our first year, we came in last place. Um, which isn't really last place, but it's last place. Right? Well, here's the thing. I, I get it. It's last place. I understand that feeling, but... In that room, we were in last place. There's yes. a funny story. If people want to read it, it's it's. I think the book starts out with that story. But, yes, exactly. Um, you get to decide your perspective. It's like the documentary, mm-hmm. The Last Dance with Michael Jordan, where he talks yeah. about um, how people would accidentally bump into him and then he would decide that they did it with intention just to fuel his competitiveness. Um, another way to say that is one of my favorite quotes from my dad, adversity is a terrible thing to waste. Um, that is true in the normal course of life. We can't control what adversity is thrown our way, but we can control how we react to it, how we allow it mm-hmm. to fuel us, how we allow it to stoke our competitive fires and all of that. Um, and sometimes you don't need for adversity. You don't need to wait for adversity to come to you organically. Yeah. You can just manufacture it. Mm-hmm. And so even if I wasn't genuinely upset about having come in last place, I still likely would have used it as a reason to push me yeah. harder. Yeah. Um, now, I got super angry when we were in last place. How is this possible? We're one of the best restaurants in America. That we're number 50 in the world. That doesn't make sense. But ultimately got to acceptance. Because here's the thing about that list. It's patently absurd to say that one restaurant is the best restaurant in the world. What that list acknowledges is the restaurant that's having the greatest impact on the world of restaurants. Um, I think that's... that. You share that in the book, and I think that is so profound. Hmm. We can be the best metric wise, but if we're not making an impact, what is it worth? Yeah, then what are we doing? And it's it's certainly a lot less fulfilling, and there's a lot less legacy that comes out of it if you're just a yeah. practitioner. Yeah. Um, but and so with that acknowledgement, that night I started thinking about the other restaurants that had topped that list before us. And, there's a restaurant in Copenhagen uh, with the chef Rene Redzepi. They kind of pioneered the whole idea of foraging for ingredients and creating a restaurant that wouldn't make sense to experience anywhere else in the world, but exactly where it was. Or a chef named Rene or Ferran Adria from from the restaurant El Bouilly in Spain, who pioneered molecular gastronomy, which is a technique that's used in every restaurant in the world, whether in large doses or very um, small doses. Both of these chefs were unreasonable in pursuit of their product and relentless about what needed to change about the product. They were willing to do whatever it took in pursuit of the ingredients, the technique, the presentation. Um, That night after we came in last place, my dad gave me this paperweight, which I have on my desk to this day. He gave it to me when I was a kid. It says, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? And he would always encourage me to answer that question honestly. And whatever the answer was to just try to do that, saying that far too many people are scared to say their most audacious goals out loud for fear that if they do and then don't achieve them, they'll let themselves and everyone around them down. But if you don't have the confidence and conviction to dream big out loud, you'll never achieve it. Um, And so that night I wrote on this cocktail napkin, we will be number one in the world. But any leader, a goal without a strategy that you are going to employ to try to achieve it is is really meaningless. It's a nightmare. Um, and so underneath that, I had to write what our impact was going to make. And if they were unreasonable in pursuit of product and relentless in pursuit of what needed to change about that product, I decided I wanted to be unreasonable in pursuit of people and relentless in pursuit of the one thing that would never change, which is our collective desire to feel seen, to feel a sense of belonging to feel welcome. And so then I wrote on reasonable hospitality on that same cocktail napkin. And it was really in that night that this new journey began. Um, This kind of recognition that in my world, and I think the ingredients are different based on businesses, but the recipe is the same. In my world, the food, the service, and the room, they're just ingredients in the recipe of human connection. 
end. Mm -hmm. If we could focus as much on connection as we always had been focusing on the food we were serving, then we could make a real significant impact. What do you think? So to take that a step, why do you think it was missing in the restaurateur industry that allowed you to focus on that to be the the impactful difference? Well, I think it's missing in most industries. Um, I think it's missing in most industries because people reserve their best efforts for the thing they're serving or selling and don't have much margin for the things that are left. Um, okay. I also think there's a timeliness to it. I think, I mean, following the pandemic, talking about the hybrid workplace, everything that, yeah. that you're, you're referencing right now, I think we, well, thinking about the digital transformation and now the increasing presence of AI, I think as a species, we're reconnecting with our genuine need to feel connected to other people in a way that we maybe always didn't feel was as important because it was never taken away from us as much as it's been removed from us recently. Um, but I think so many of the people that succeed do so because of the products. and. Now is this moment where I just think there's this general reckoning that that's just not enough anymore. And by the way, it's not enough for the person on the receiving end. And it's also increasingly not enough for the people on the serving end. Because if all you're doing is selling someone a product, that's not a very fulfilling life mm -hmm. to live. Mm -hmm. It's actually the presence of hospitality at the center of a culture where people on the team are given the permission and the resources to bring their own creativity to how they make other people feel that transforms a culture, right? It starts from within. It goes back to the whole hospitality as a team sport thing. Because if you can create an environment where the people on your team are able to imbue the experience they're serving with their own creativity, not only will they be so much more motivated to make the experience as good as it possibly can based on the agency and empowerment that they feel, but, and I've said this a million times, I don't think there's anything more energizing than the look on someone's face when they receive a gift you're responsible for giving them. We're in this time when everyone's struggling with staffing and depletion and burnout, and people are giving people more days off and paying them a little bit more, both of which important, but both of which are effectively treating symptoms and not the underlying condition, Meaning. which is to make work more fulfilling. Well, I, I think the, the circle that goes around all of this, we, we've talked about, it, it doesn't matter if you're leading, it doesn't matter if you're serving, it doesn't matter if you're uh, interacting in your community. I, I think the pandemic really showed that we are a wildly disconnected community world and everyone is yearning. What you just told me was connection. I want to be connected to why are we doing this? Who are we serving? What are we trying to accomplish? What's the bigger picture? And I believe that the, the pandemic forced that. I believe it's also this, this movement from a generation. We, I talked to you about this before. We are moving from generations of leaders, from a, a leadership uh, basis that is, you know, we'll call it, you know, baby boomer to now millennial and Gen Z. And we all have a different perspective of the world. And it used to be where you know, if you go into different um, sociological studies where it's, you know, what is like the normal group of community friends? No, it's like 148 people. Well, now we don't, we have a much, much larger connection group, but you know, those connections are so shallow it's just you walk in fast food, bam, off and gone. There's not that relationship that's built, but that's happened in all of our relationships, our work relationships. Well, I don't want to have that deep connection with people that I work with because I'm just doing my job. I want to have connection with people outside of that, but then we lose that outside. And so we're left with nothing. Hmm. And I think, you know, as you bring up and you go back to the, the new hire process, in making sure that that connection, hey, you're a new class, I'm connecting you guys. We're connecting here to what we're serving is a 
piece of leadership that it, it isn't required, but it is absolutely demanded to a point where it is a non-negotiable. Well, I think having, I believe hospitality is the new or will soon be the new required leadership skill. Yeah. This, these are my, this yeah. is my, my like chronology Your of thesis? leadership skills. Okay. Leaders once upon a time needed to just be the person in the room with the confidence and conviction to say to a bunch of other people, this is where we're going. And people crave leadership, so they would follow that person. Then that was no longer enough. And my, my friend Simon Sinek with his book, Start With Why, yeah. people needed to be inspired to want to go there. They needed to understand why they should want to. Um, then generationally, it changed again. And this is a lot about what my book is. Um, even a group of people being inspired to want to go somewhere wasn't enough. They needed to feel like they were a part of determining how you were going to get there. Generationally, people needed agency and in sense of ownership and inclusion to yeah. want to follow someone like I'll follow you yeah. so long as you listen to what I have to say as well. By yeah. the way, it's a beautiful thing. Now, post pandemic, things have changed hybrid remote. The people on your team are not organically connecting like they once were around the metaphorical water cooler or after work at happy hour. Um, and in the absence of your team feeling that bond, they have an inability to cease being a collection of individuals and come together as a trusting team. And only once you've done that, can you unlock their collective creativity and capacity. There's data out there that says people are far less likely to leave a job once they have one or two good friends at mm -hmm. that job. But now the leader needs to be much more intentional about creating the conditions yep. for connection. They I think can't is... waste meetings. They need to take gatherings seriously. They need to make sure that they're sowing the seeds for relationships that transcend efficiency in product. I had this conversation on Tuesday. I brought it up again today, and I'm going to paint this picture. And it's time stamped here. It's recorded. And what you just described to me as we come into a workplace is we're in this big meadow. Right. If you're having a meeting in your workplace, you new hire meeting, we'll go back to that. You're having your your normal pre uh, meal service. It's like a meadow and everyone's milling around. They're trying to find their spot They're They're like animals grazing. Hmm. Well, you know, to accomplish what you're going to accomplish, you have to go through the mountain pass and there's a trail through the mountain pass. And so you're leading the group. You're the shepherd. You're trying to get everyone efficiently through the pass. And you have to create time for them to mill around in the meadow. They need to rest. They need to graze. They need to figure out who is the boss cow, right? Who is the one that's going to push everyone around? And they just kind of fall in and they find their place. We, we have to have that in meetings. We have to have that in communities because this is one thing that I've learned. It's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's true. Why don't animals graze in single file? Hmm. I love that. Because they're going to end up eating the shit from the one in front of them. I love that. They have to be able to spread around. They have to be able to find out that, hey, maybe that mountain trail that I want to go up that I think is the right way, maybe that's not the right trail. Maybe there's one over tucked around in the corner, but somebody grazing over there, laying down over there, spending time over there is going to find that. And then when it's time to go through the trail, we're single file, we can go fast, we can go directive, we can make sure we get through that, but we have to be fully prepared beforehand. And as a leader, if we're trying to shove everyone in from an agenda point of view and not allowing that time for people to graze, then we're not going to get through that pass. We're going to just bottleneck and then it's going to be the Donner party all over again. Yeah. I love that. I think that's really smart. Um, to say, and I was talking about this recently, I started a business with a, with a buddy of mine and, and, a, and each of our respective teams over the course of the pandemic. And every time we'd get together for a zoom to, you know, do whatever we we're doing, 
um, my team and his team started getting really close. And so the Zoom would start, but it would never be like before seven minutes into the Zoom that we'd actually start getting into the work because everyone would want to catch up. And, and I can always see on his facial expression, he did not have the ability to like hide his feelings, but he was very, very annoyed during those seven minutes. And then the meeting would start and then he'd be great. And I called him one day after and said, hey, dude, what's going on with you in the first seven minutes? Like, what, what's that energy? And he goes, I hate small talk. He goes, I'm on Zooms all day. It's a waste. I just want to get into it. Let's just get the work done. Um, I could not disagree more. I think if a leader is only focused on efficiency, they will become less efficient. To your point, you can't just go up the mountaintop. You need time to graze and you need time for the team to feel connected because the more connected they are to one another, the less inclined they are going to be to want to let one another down. Um, and so I think creating space with intention, mm -hmm. not just you're lazy and you're not ready to start the meeting, but you've made the call. One of my colleagues um, who you know, her name is Marin. Um, that is especially important to her. Now I have a small team right now. And so we have Zooms all the time. And so we don't just have small talk for the first seven minutes of every Zoom because we might be on three Zooms over the course yeah. of the day. But sometimes it's clear and that we do need it. And I'll just say right when it starts, hey guys, let's get a quick Marin 10 in. There you go. And that means we're taking 10 minutes. It's not for yeah. or about Marin anymore. That's just no. the naming mechanism around it. Yeah. And it's just a check-in time. Yeah. A time to check in with one another, not just as professionals, but as people. I believe it's essential. I believe it comes back to connection. Um, but here's the, the question that I posed when, when I shared that and that came to me. And I'll ask for you to answer this. Is it more important to have everyone together and not reach the point where you want to go? Or is it better to reach the point where you want to go, but have lost everyone? <laughs> because that's the the question that every leader faces at some point in the day, in the week, when it comes down to a deadline, to a meeting, a requirement, whatever else. Would you rather have everyone with you and we're not quite there, but we're on our way or I'm going to get there and I don't care who's with me? Man, I don't know if it's such a... A binary answer. Yeah, I, yeah, I get it. I, I think that it's hard. You need to always invite people along, give them the resources required such that they have the capacity to be right alongside you. Um, if certain people opt out along the way because they just decide that what you're trying to accomplish is not right for them. I'm not going to slow down or lower my ambition for one or two people. Sure. But you, you framed it in an absolute perspective. Mm -hmm. You have everyone with you and you haven't achieved it or no one with you and you have. Um, I guess I don't think that's a real question because I don't think it's possible to achieve it if you have no one left. You know, like if you've lost I, I, everybody. That then... is the answer to the question. Yeah. Because I believe to what you're saying is like, well, there's going to be people, the New York Yankees this year, they're not going to have the, the same roster on October 1st, the end of the season, as they do, you know, today. But they're still a team, right? Yes. And it's how many of those guys are still engaged. How many of those are still playing? All right, that's going to determine where they yeah, end you up. you got to play that offense. If all you have is the pitcher on the field, you're never going to win a single game. <laughs> I don't, I don't care done. if it's the best pitcher in the world. You're done, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, that's – so that, it, it's absolute, but I think what I take from that and, and appreciate your interjection there is – it isn't absolute, but at the same point, I believe this. If you have the team with you, you may not hit the deadline in the time frame that you first wanted, but you will hit it. And yes. if you don't have people, it doesn't matter. You'll never, even if you think you hit it, you didn't hit it. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that. I like, And I, I think what I was trying to say in the first one is just because you haven't 
picked the exact right team on day one of the season. And it turns out that two months in, a couple, your left fielder and your shortstop, yeah. they're not right. And you need to move on from them and bring on two people who are right for the team. That doesn't show a failure in leadership. It just shows that you have the capacity to course correct along the way. Absolutely. And that to me is more important. We can just have the rest of our conversation around a baseball analogy and see how far we can take it. <laughs> you know, considering how many people view watch baseball, I think we'd lose a lot of people because <laughs> it's a dying sport. Um, I do want to, for the last few minutes, because I, I really wanted to ask about this because I know, one, the way you spoke of them, you've spoken about them in our time already. How important? You mentioned, I think, three major mentors. I think you have more um, in your life, but very impactful people in your life that you reference. You mentioned Danny earlier. Yeah. You talk about your dad. But I also took from this what you wrote, that your mom was very, very instrumental in you seeing things that not everyone else would see. Hmm. Yeah, my mom's my mom was quadriplegic growing up and we don't need to go into the whole story. We don't have we don't have time for that right now. But um, in my relationship with her, a few really really powerful things happened. One, I mean, I was serving her when I was like twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I was cooking her dinner. Right, that was just my dad and I were a team. We had to figure it out. We had to run our household. And in serving my mother at such an early age. I never felt bad for myself, perhaps mostly because my dad never felt bad for himself. He led by example in that way. But to the contrary, I felt good because I was given the gift of being able to serve my mother, something that yeah. maybe I didn't have things that, all my friends had in the relationships they had with their moms, but I had yeah, the unique ability to serve her something that they never got to experience. And I felt great. And I wanted to do that for the rest of my life. And even though she was a quadriplegic, how loved I felt by her consistently through the way she smiled at me, the energy she sent to me from across the room, It instilled in me at an early age, not only the obvious impact of nonverbal communication, but the unbelievable power that hospitality has to positively impact those around them. That even this person who could not walk or move had the ability to make me feel loved and to make my day a better day because she, through intention with the limited capacity she had did everything she could and it was profound yeah so my mother was extraordinarily impactful and probably should start talking about her as a mentor because in many ways she was i do think mentorship is extraordinarily important i i don't think you're ever too young to be a mentor and I don't think you're ever too old to have a mentor and if anyone looks at their lives and realizes that they're not currently wearing both of those hats as a mentor and a mentee regardless of where you're at in your career or in your life I would encourage you through intention to try to fix that I think the the mentor relationship as a leader is the best I guess way to look at being a leader in my mind. If we're choosing to mentor, then we want better for someone else, even though it may not, may be better for us. But if we're collectively doing that together, it is going to be better for all of us. And I think that idea and mentality is the mentality to have. I believe that's a level five leader from Jim Collins. Go ahead. Well, and a great leader should also have a mentor because it, shows very clearly that they understand that they still have a lot to learn and it yeah. brings the humility required to be a great leader. Totally. Well, um, I, I think that's the cherry on top. That's the, the 5%. 
Um, and I want to leave it there. Thank you so Man, much. Man, I feel like we never got through the first question. We could do this for a lot longer, <laughs> but I appreciate you. And I really enjoyed that conversation and I hope others did too. Thanks so much, Will. Thanks, bud. As I wrap up from this conversation with Will, there's two things that I want to really kind of focus on. One is the three C's that we discussed. That is connection, communication, and consistency. Those elements, I think, are not only imperative in regard to unreasonable hospitality, hospitality in general, but in leadership, in life, in relationships. The next one is we have mentors in our life that impact us and affect us. And uh, the fact that when I asked Will about his mom that he wrote about briefly, but wrote about and how she impacted him. I, I can see from our conversation, our interaction, that she was one of his most impressive mentors. Not, you know, his dad, Danny Meyer, professors, those people, you, the, the people around him. Yes, absolutely. But his mom. And just think about that. There are people impacting you in your life. And maybe their circumstances are different. Learn from them. Be fascinated by what they have to share with you. Because you will learn more from that than overlooking. I thank you for being here. Again, super excited to share this time with you. Uh, that you're a subscriber. That you share with us. But as well, one last invitation. The Impact Driven Workshop. Go to impactdrivenworkshop.com to learn more. Love to see you there. Till next time, have a good one.